Our final speaker before we get into the, the broad discussion is uh, Eugene, who's the General Manager of Health and Community Engagement for iCare. Now, you may not have heard of iCare, but they probably know about you because they insure over 3 million New South Wales residents and manage $32 billion. They are one of the largest insurers in Australia. So for them, there is an incentive to get people back to work sooner and for people to be healthier. So please join me in welcoming Eugene. Um, so, believe it or not, back in 1979, I started my career in, in nursing. I was 18 years old, and um, I decided to um, work in mental health nursing or psychiatric nursing at the time in a place called Stafford, which is in the middle of England. You might know Stafford because it has a prison there where Rolf Harris stayed for a couple of years. That, the, the, problem, the issue then, back in 1979, is that if you had a mental health problem or a mental illness, you came to hospital, and often you stayed in hospital. And those hospitals were hospital really only by name, that my memories of those times was that there was very much an asylum. It was out of the way, it was out of the city centre, and it was right next to the prison, and it was right next to the abattoir places that needed to, to happen but were far away from the, from the city itself. I mention that because it's important to, to realise how far we've come in the mental health space. Um, we had, and I remember looking after people who had been admitted to that hospital simply because they had married, they had a baby out of wedlock or they had ep epilepsy. Um, and they'd been there 20, 30 years and they were institutionalised. So I've seen that transformation in the mental health space where we've gone from the asylum to community care. And I know here in, in Sydney, in Australia, the Richmond Report sparked the, the, the move into the community. It's very interesting to see here that the asylums are all next to the rivers so that the people with mental illness didn't have to travel on the King's Road. And so there's this huge stigma around mental health which was there then and to some extent is still with us now. And so I'll come back to that a little bit now um, in a second. So I care is very interested in the mentally healthy workplace. The cost of mental illness to the economy in Australia is $56 billion a year. So that's 3.4% of the, of the GDP. That's actually the least of the cost. The cost actually is to community, to family and to health. And we know that mental illness can lead to a whole range of other issues, social issues, including domestic violence, marriage breakdowns, addiction, so on and so forth, and homelessness. And I don't remember back in 1979 seeing so many homeless people on the street in London, where I worked a lot, um, but that, as I've seen now in Sydney. And I wonder what's going on. And for eye care, it's really important that we fix or do, do our best to incentivise mentally healthy workplaces. It seems to us that the community has, lo has been lost and the community at home has been, um, I guess, fragmented and replaced by community at work. And we need to do something about replacing community at home by doing some work with the community at home. So we now know, and it's, we've got the evidence that shows that a mentally healthy workplace will improve productivity by, will have a return on investment of at least $3.4 uh, for every dollar invested. We know what the characteristics of a mentally healthy workplace are. They include things like having strong job design, where people's jobs are doable within the time that they're contracted for, where the job is aligned to their strengths, and where there is challenges in their job, they're able to be supported to achieve those challenges. We also know that workplaces that don't tolerate um, discrimination, don't tolerate se sexual harassment, don't tolerate bigotry or racism, are also protective for people's mental health. We know that organisations that support individuals to build resilience, personal resilience, to take time to do the things that build that resilience, like mindfulness, like exercise, like eating well, like taking time for the family, like allowing the man 
to go and pick up the kids from school and not thinking it's just the women's job to do that. We know that that has protective factors for people in the workplace. We also know that when people do become ill, that if they feel that that culture allows them to say, I'm not well, and not feel that they will be punished by that, most people that do say, I'm not well, I have a mental health problem in the workplace, either suffer by being moved sideways, or their rise up the promotion ladder, ladder is halted, or they lose their jobs. So when you see that happening, you're not going to tell your boss that you have a mental health issue. And if you're not identifying that earlier and you're not seeking help earlier, we know the duration and disability of that mental illness is going to exacerbate and get worse. A frog in the throat, sorry. <clears throat> the last thing that we know is that when people do go off, I'm not emotional. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> that's better, I think. Um, when people do go off um, and their boss rings them and says, how are you doing? We want to help you get back. What can we do? But they're more likely to come back to work. They're more likely to want to come and work with their boss again. They're more likely not to be ashamed of them having a mental health problem. But when they go off and they, they're off with depression and the boss doesn't call them, doesn't really care about them until they ring in sick two weeks later saying their GP says they have to have another six months off, then that's more likely to keep them off work. It's more likely to be an adversarial relationship. And it's more likely to lead to a psychiatric claim. And it's more likely for that person not to ever go back to work again. So it's a lose-lose for everybody. So a simple message for any manager when anybody goes off sick is just give them a call. It will save not only you money, but it also will make that person more um, loyal to you and to your, your organisation. So we know that. Yet we know all that, we have all that evidence. How are we doing in Australia? One in five organisations have those characteristics in place. 80% of organisations do not. So if we did one thing, if we're able to nudge the behaviour of CEOs across Australia to improve just those characteristics, that's not rocket science, it's actually management 101, it's leadership 101, it's how you look after your people. And if CEOs aren't able to do that, then no wonder we're in the state that we are at the moment. And we are in a state. Out of 20 OECD countries, Australia are 19th in the world for the participation rates of people with disabilities and mental illness. That's an absolute disgrace as far as I'm concerned. And it just shows how the workplaces do not tolerate people that do not fit into their narrow band of behaviour. And I think that's something that we need, to, we need to challenge. The final thing I want to say is that each one of us has a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to ourselves to be resilient and to do resilient stuff. And be mindful, do the exercise, eat well. But we also have a responsibility to take care for our colleagues. Make sure we're not bigoted, we're not discriminating, that we tolerate. And that we ask the question, are you okay? And we authentically listen to what they say and that we help them seek help when they're not okay. But more importantly, I think it's important that each one of us, when we are struggling with our mental health, because I guarantee you, most people in this room will have been there or will be there at some point in the future, that we talk about it. And by talking about it, we get rid of the stigma. And when we get rid of the stigma, we get rid of the problem. Thank you.